today as we come to the table. Grasp this. You think you've got it bad at work. Well, there aren't that many people at the workplace that know the Lord. And I go to school with a bunch of people that are the same. Nobody in my family knows the Lord. Listen, Noah and his family was it for the entire world. That's it. There was nobody that else that received. And I think about it from a preacher's standpoint. I think, man, that would have been hard. You know, you wonder how many opportunities Noah said, you know what, you need to give your life to the Lord. And nobody said, no, I'm going to do it. How many tracks were strewn all over the desert there, you know, with Noah trying to share the Lord? I don't know. But the bottom line is, is that nobody came. And yet Noah was this preacher of righteousness during this 120 years. And can you imagine the mockery? Can you imagine opening up a diner with the best food ever and wanting to just get people in to eat? What if you went out onto the streets and invited anyone and everyone to come in and try your food for free? Imagine now that no one would come in and eat. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table. The Daily Bible Study Program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message... Pastor Mark teaches us about how God gave Noah 120 years to warn the people that the flood was coming, and no one listened. Have you answered God's invitation to be saved from the wrath that's going to come on the world? Now, now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 as he continues his message, The Cause of the Flood. Notice in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, we find another very interesting relationship to this particular issue. It relates directly to Noah and the days of Noah, also speaking of these, these angels. Notice it says in verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to, your Bible probably says hell, the word literally there in the Greek is tartarus. It is the only time in the Bible the word is used. And it is apparently some holding tank that God put these fallen angels in. Again, we saw in Jude 5 that God took these angels, 5 through 7, took these angels and put them in some particular place. Right here in 2 Peter chapter 2, we find out where God put them. It's a place where he cast them called Tartarus, some type of supernatural holding tank. It is not the same word used throughout the scripture for hell, which is the word Sheol or Gehenna or other words. No, this is a totally different word. And notice it says he cast them into this Tartarus, these angels that sinned, and he delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Again, we know these are not the fallen angels alone because they still roam free. This is the fallen angels plus some group of angels within the fallen angels that did something so bad, God said, I'm not even going to give you freedom until judgment day. You're locked up now in Tartarus, and I'll bring you out at judgment day to deal with you, and then I'll deal with the rest of the demons at that time as well. Notice it goes on. In the context, this is important to see here. And notice it says, And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. Now we see Noah tied in. But saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness. Notice Noah was a preacher. I think it's fair to say biblically Noah here was a pastor. He was a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities. Again, notice the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah again, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, that is those who had gone after a strange flesh, into ashes and condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked. I believe we see here in these passages, if you'll notice, it mentions the angels, it mentions the days of Noah, it mentions the sexual immorality, and the two are linked together in the passages of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so I believe we see him talking about this very possibly talking about the event we're looking at in Genesis chapter 6. And may very well be a hint from the Holy Spirit. Either way, we see something going on here so drastic that God had to judge the earth. And there's some other hints in Genesis that make it lean toward that way as well. Let's flip back now to Genesis and get back to the passage. 
Again, notice what the Lord says here. He goes on after saying that the sons of God had come into the daughters of men. In verse 3, and it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now notice next, due to man's corruption of whatever it was that took place back here in Genesis chapter 6, God set a limit as to how long he would strive with or allow man to live without bringing judgment. 120 years. Now, Notice this, 120 years, God says, I'll bring judgment. But God also noticed that God said, it's going to be 120 years before I bring judgment. What's my point? That is a God of long suffering. Now, again, remember, these are people that God knew were not going to turn. But God said, you know what? I'm going to give you more time. I'm going to give you more time. I'm going to give you 120 years. I still want you to come. This shows the love of God, the long-suffering heart of God, and God giving the time to repent. God is a gracious God. Let us never say that God is quick to judgment. Or that God desires wrath. The Bible says that God desires that none perish. But here's the bottom line. God says, no, I give a time of long suffering, a time of patience, a time of grace. And so I think we need to note that first. I think 120 years is plenty enough time to repent, don't you? And yet there's a second lesson in this. Not only is God gracious and long suffering and merciful, but it also shows us that God does finally say enough. And although God may be gracious and waiting for us in our time of decision as to whether or not we're going to give our lives to him and receive his son as our savior, the Bible says there'll come a day where God says, that's it, now it's time for judgment. And what's exciting here to me, it was during this 120 years that Noah was building the ark, and again, Second Peter calls him a preacher of righteousness, that he was witnessing and preaching. Now grasp this, you think you've got it bad at work. Oh, there aren't that many people at the workplace that know the Lord. And I go to school with a bunch of people that are unsaved. Nobody in my family knows the Lord. Listen, Noah and his family was it for the entire world. That's it. There was nobody that else that received. And I think about it from a preacher's standpoint. I think, man, that would have been hard. You know, you wonder how many opportunities Noah said, you know what, you need to give your life to the Lord. And nobody said, no, I'm going to do it. How many tracks were strewn all over the desert there, you know, with Noah trying to share the Lord? I don't know. But the bottom line is, is that nobody came. And yet Noah was this preacher of righteousness during this 120 years. And can you imagine the mockery? Now, let's lay the groundwork as to why the mockery would be so great. You see, the Bible indicates that it had never rained before the flood. Where does it indicate that? Well, back in creation in Genesis, it says that God made a mist that came up from the ground that watered the earth. And there's no mention of rain until after the flood. And scientists believe that after this water canopy that used to surround the earth, that the Bible talks about in creation, when that was released and the flood was brought onto the earth, that it changed the environment to where there's this moisture exchange. And now we have these rainstorms as we, as we know them today. But note this, prior to that, there probably wasn't rain. And I think good theological basis for that. Why is that so key? Because here's Noah in the middle of nowhere building a boat with no ocean anywhere nearby. And this was a large boat. This was nothing you would ski behind at the lake on the weekends. And we'll get to that when we see the size of it later on. And the whole time he's saying God's going to bring judgment on this world and he's going to flood it by rain. Can you imagine the mockery? Can you imagine the laughing? Guys, here's my point. Noah was not afraid to make a stand in the midst of intense mockery. And I mean intense. Where are we? Do we sometimes find ourselves backing down because, oh, they may not like me? I want them to like me. Now, I come from an entertainment background and the entertainer wants people to like them. That's their job. Make you like me. And then if I'm working somewhere and I make you like me enough, they're going to keep me working there. And that's more money for me. And that's more money for you. And everybody's happy, right? Except God, of course. But the point is, as an entertainer, the type of entertainment I was doing, that was the case. But the bottom line is, when we come to the Lord, everyone is not going to like us. That's okay. That's all right. Jesus said this, woe to you if all men speak well of you. Let me ask you a question. Does everybody like you? I mean, everybody? I suggest to you that if everybody likes you, you've got a problem in that they shouldn't because you're not being what you should be with God. Now, that doesn't mean going around to be, you know, rude all the time and yelling at people and being this, but the point is we need to be likable. The Bible says that Jesus had favor with man and God, so don't get me wrong. We should be gracious. We should have favor with man and God, but there's going to be people that come along that don't like you just because of your smile because you're a Christian. Where's the, wipe that stupid smile off your face. Don't you have any problems? What's wrong with you? Yes, I have problems, but the Lord helps me with them. Well, that just makes me sick. You know, there's, because you're a Christian, they're not going to like you. And so understand when you're being that testimony, there are people that aren't going to like you, but I love Noah because Noah stayed faithful. That was the life of the Christian on the earth at that time was Noah. And yet Noah was faithful. 
And so, again, we need to take that example from Noah and say, you know what? All right, Lord, that's where I want to be. I want to be faithful. And notice it goes on after verse 3 and says this. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. There are a couple things to notice here. Notice, number one, there were giants on the earth in those days. And again, could have been a result from this angelic offspring, if you will. And some people even believe that, postulate that very possibly this is where a lot of the mythology comes from. Not from something that wasn't real, but maybe this interaction between angels and mankind, and it developed into all of these mythological gods and man's relation with human. We don't know. But again, it is very interesting in light of, of what's going on here, the episode on the earth, the giants and all that. Notice verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent and thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Again, imagine how alone Noah must have felt. Think about Noah. He must have felt so alone. I think about Elijah. You know, sometimes we think we're the only one. Nobody in my family knows the Lord. Nobody at work. This is it. And yet he made that faithful stand. Think about Elijah. Remember when Elijah was being a testimony there in Samaria, and then Jezebel got mad at him, and Elijah takes off to Mount Horeb, and he's out there at Mount Horeb just pouting. He's like, Lord, I'm the only one. Nobody else is making a stand. It's only me. And he felt, well, he felt, well, horrible. And so God comes to him. You'll get it in a minute. God comes to him and says, Elijah, you're not the only one. As a matter of fact, I've kept 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so you're not alone. Go out there and be a testimony. What's interesting to me, God could say that to Elijah. But when he talked to Noah, what did he have to say? God, I feel so alone. You are alone. So very alone. You know? <laughs> you know? And yet, and yet, God says, continue to be faithful. And maybe some of you feel alone, so very alone in your stand for Christ. Noah was faithful after God brought the judgment for another 120 years or after he announced the judgment. Guys, we need to be faithful in the Lord. And again, you can imagine how wicked it must have been if everybody but Noah's family was evil. I think about today. Again, there's a lot of evil in the world today, but not everyone is evil. Noah was really in dire straits here. And notice at verse 6, it says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've made them. So now we see God again saying, I've got to wipe the slate clean and start over and just start from the beginning, if you will, almost this earthly baptism, if you will, cleansing the old and bringing the new alive. And what a picture of baptism that is. Even as we have the baptism today, God, in essence, baptized the earth and put the old away and brought the new to life in new life, again, preserving Jonah and his family in it. But God now realizes that man's not going to turn, even though he's given him so much time and so much opportunity. And now he says, I'm going to bring judgment. But notice verse 8. I love this turn here. This is where the hope comes in. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. For those who think they simply can't find grace in the eyes of the Lord or make that stand, notice Noah did. He did both. He made the stand. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And let me say this. We may not always be able to find grace in the eyes of man. You're not going to make everybody happy. Everybody in your family, everybody at your workplace, you name it. They're not all going to be happy. But as long as God's happy, that's all that matters. Noah knew what his priority was. And he said, you know what? I want God to be pleased with me. And so he found grace in the eyes of God. This is why he found grace. Notice verse 9. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. And Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now, again, how did Noah, notice it says Noah found grace. It literally means found favor and acceptance. But how did Noah find favor and acceptance along with his family while others did not? He tells us. Notice this. He was a just man. He was perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. Again, what does the word just mean? Just means lawful, righteous, straightforward, and upright. It basically means this was a man of God. He was righteous. Righteous means right with God. Straightforward. You knew what, you know, what he meant. What he said is what he meant. He was a man of integrity. He was upright before people. That was the first thing it says about Noah. Notice the second thing it says. He was perfect. Now, again, the word doesn't mean without any flaw at all. It means complete or whole or sound. In Scripture, it's a sign of maturity. And so what it's saying is, is that Noah matured in the Lord. He spent time with the Lord. He didn't just stay where he was. He spent time with the Lord. And because of that, he became mature. And due to that maturity, he pleased God. Again, we need to be maturing in the Lord and growing in the Lord. Time in the Word, time in prayer. And notice lastly, it says he walked with God. It means as a manner of life. Now note that, as a manner of life, he walked with the Lord. 
Remember, John talks about those who as a manner of life or as a lifestyle live in sin and those who as a manner of life live righteously. And John says that's how you can tell the difference between the true and the fake, the real believer and the false. He said the the fake believer will say that they're saved, but as a manner of life, they walk in sin. It's just a daily, normal, unconvicted state they stay in. Whereas the righteous will walk in righteousness. They will walk with God as a lifestyle. Here's the difference. The righteous occasionally stumble. Those who are in darkness continually stumble. And so that's the difference here with Noah. Noah was walking with God and had the righteous life in place. Now, again, where does this apply to us? Well, if we want to find grace and salvation in God's eyes, we need to do exactly what Noah did. And that is we need to do what is lawful and righteous. We need to be sound in Jesus Christ. And we need to walk with God as a manner of life. That's the requirements in order to come to the Lord. So, again, this is where it leaves us today. You see, this is where the question comes in for us. And that is, is do you want to find grace in God's eyes today or in man's eyes? Where's your priority? Are you worried about pleasing everyone and what they think and whether or not they like the way you look or the way you, whatever the case might be, or is it more I'm concerned about what God thinks? Do I want to find grace in God's eyes? Because that's what really matters and that's what's going to be eternal. How do we find that grace? Well, it's done through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that our righteousness comes through him and what he's done on the cross. So receiving Jesus, we didn't have that righteousness that God requires. Now, you might ask, well, why do I need to worry about that? Because the flood is past and gone. I don't need to worry about the flood. I mean, this is a whole new generation, and and I'm not sure I even believe that, wherever you're coming from. Listen, the Bible also says that God is going to bring judgment on this earth again sometime in the future. And although God is long-suffering and God is gracious and God is saying, welcome in, there comes a time when God says, enough is enough. You know what's interesting about the ark? How many doors did it have? It had one door. Jesus said, I am the door. And no one goes to the Father except by me. Even as God set the example in the ark, there was one door. There was one way in. There was one way out. That was the only way to get into the ark was by that door. And God told Noah, he said, when you shut that door after 20 years of preaching and warning the people, when you shut that door, it can't be reopened. I try to imagine, and maybe some of you do this, but I play these things out in my mind. And I try to imagine what it would have been like had there been no rain ever. Noah's built this boat. Everyone's making fun of him. He's been preaching to them about this judgment that's to come. He's been saying the same thing for 120 years. Yeah, Jesus is coming back. Yeah, God's going to judge. Well, where is he? What's going on? What kind of mockery? We don't know. But we know he was most certainly under intense mockery. And all of a sudden, one day, somebody on their front porch hears a thud. Then they start hearing several thuds. And they hold their hand out. And suddenly, what's this? Well, there's this water. There's water falling from from the sky, hey, Josephus, come out here. There's water falling. What is this? There's water falling out of the sky. You're kidding. Water, where's that coming from? Well, that's weird. This has never happened. I don't know what that, this is strange. Wait a minute. Wasn't there this crazy preacher, this guy Noah, building that boat? Oh, yeah, that guy's a nut. I mean, he's a religious fanatic, you know, whatever. Yeah, but didn't he say that there was going to come a day when God was going to judge everything and he was going to do it by water and by a flood? Oh, well, yeah, he said that, but we know the guy's crazy, I think. Well, probably it wouldn't hurt to go check. I mean, I mean, maybe, maybe we could get on the boat just in case. I mean, I don't really believe it. I'm not one of those religious nuts, but I don't really believe it. But you know what? Some flood insurance would, wouldn't be bad. So let's go and find out and show up to the ark. You know, and I don't know. You, know, you wonder, were there people beginning to gather at the ark? Hey, Noah, uh, we, we changed our mind. I mean, we, we don't really know what's going to happen, but this is kind of new and it's a little bit strange. And could we just kind of sit on there with you for a while until it starts? And how deathly silent it would have been if that indeed happened. And again, the scripture doesn't tell us. To hear the answer come back, it's too late. Well, what do you mean it's too late? It hadn't flooded yet. I mean, we're still here. It's raining. There's still plenty of room in the ark. Why don't you just just open the door, lower the drawbridge? No, you don't understand. God commanded me that once the door was closed that no one else could enter. And that's why I preached to you for 120 years. That's why I made the plea to you for so long to come to Christ, except back then it would have been to believe in the promised seed. You wonder, how did Noah even believe? He believed in the promised seed that was promised. And those who believed in that promised seed were believing in Jesus, although they didn't know his name yet. And he said, I told you about the promise of God to send someone that would take away the sin, but you rejected, you wouldn't take it. You know, it's interesting. They believe they found Noah's Ark, and whether or not they have or not doesn't matter, and they didn't need to find the Ark for us to believe. We believe God's Word without such discoveries. But it is interesting, this boat that they found now up on the mountains there in Iran and all, and they have what they say are wood 
truly wood, petrified wood, and, and things that are from the ocean, you know, in it, and all these kind of things. In other words, things that should not be there. There shouldn't be a boat there. There shouldn't be things from the ocean there. It's all there. And so they're doing the investigative work and all this. But I wonder if indeed, if they were to find any of the planks to the side, I wonder if one of the earmarks to show whether or not this really was Noah's Ark or not would be scratch marks. Because I wonder as the water began to rise and they realized there was nowhere to go, if they began to bang and they began to plead and they began to scratch and say, let us in. And I wonder how it must have broken Noah's heart, a man who had poured out 120 years of his life to warn them and say, you need to listen to what I'm saying. It's not a joke. It's not religion. We're talking reality and we're talking eternity. And maybe there's something that God is saying to you, this is not a joke. It is not religion. It's not just church. It is reality and it is eternity. And right now you need to make a decision. And God is piercing you in your heart right now saying, you know what, I need to make a decision. I've never really made that decision. Listen, God is calling out to you and he's giving you the opportunity. Yes, he's long-suffering. Yes, he's gracious. Yes, God waits as long as he can. But there comes a time where God says, the door must be closed. Right now, the opportunity is open to receive the Lord. And my plea to you, rather, I believe the Holy Spirit's plea to you right now is that if you haven't done that, you would make that with the Lord a signed deal right now by asking him in your heart. I just don't wait any longer. Yield to the calling of the Holy Spirit. Don't be like those who would scratch on the doors of the cross saying, let us in. And the Lord says, it's too late. I gave you opportunity and now the door is closed. Why don't we pray? Lord, you've shown us in your word that you are gracious and that you are long suffering. And Father, I thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you for giving the ark to Noah and to all those who would believe, and Lord, how sad it is that only he and his family believed and would enter into the ark. But Lord, today you've given us another ark, the ark of the cross, another door, a way into righteousness, a way into the kingdom. And the only way, as you said, no one goes to the Father except by me, you said, Lord. And we know your word says there's no other name under heaven or earth by which a man might be saved. But Lord, at the same time, we have to receive that. And maybe there's some here today that have been hearing the gospel over and over and over, but they've never truly made a commitment. They've never said, I want on board. Lord, don't let them miss the boat. And I pray you would just pour out a spirit of conviction and yet a spirit of love and begin to move in hearts right now. Noah was very bold in his speech and those who got on the boat were bold to walk on them. And God asks us to make that public proclamation. And if you say, I've never done that, I've never given my life truly to Jesus Christ, this may be the last opportunity the Lord gives you. I don't know that. And again, this is not trying to scare you into the kingdom. It's just to bring reality. This could be your opportunity. Don't fight the spirit. God is speaking to your heart. And don't listen to the voices that are saying, no, don't do this. It's not the time to do it. No, it is the time of salvation. This is the day of salvation. Father, I want to thank you for those who have chosen to give their heart and their life to you. And Lord, that they now are on the boat, so to speak, with those of us who have already made our profession of faith. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to do that. Pray this prayer with me right now between you and the Lord. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. And I do believe that Jesus died for my sin on the cross. And because of that, I can be saved. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. And I give my life to you. And I want to thank you, Lord, for giving your life for me. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's always a blessing to have you come to the table of God's Word with us each and every day. Pastor Mark's been going through the book of Genesis. And there's much to learn and appreciate from this first book of the Bible. Sometimes to fully grasp something later on, you need to understand where things began. From verse 1, God made it clear that He was there all along, and He set things in motion exactly as He instructed. Isn't it neat to see that all of creation is under God's authority? That includes you. This could seem a bit intimidating, but it's actually God's way of looking out for your best interests. Once you look at it that way, you start to realize that everything in all of creation is something that God initiated with intention, and that includes you. What a great thing to come to today. If you missed any part of this message or would like to hear this one again, you can always go back and find it at thewaymedia.net. Just click on the Come to the Table tab. Another way to access these messages is by downloading the Way Media app from the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. By doing this, 
you'll be able to take these teachings with you wherever you go. Would you like to get in touch with us? Our number is 865-609-1385. Once more, that's 865-609-1385. Feel free to call us with questions or to even ask for prayer. Please come back for another edition where Pastor Mark will continue his teaching through the book of Genesis. But next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.